Today, Ross is going to talk about, is it practical to build truly distributed payment systems? Uh, Ross Anderson. Well, thanks for the kind words and for the award that I got last year. And in my talk today, I'm going to talk about a project that we've had for the last year um, to try and build a new type of payment system. It's still just at the prototype stage, but there may be a few interesting things to learn on the technical side from you know, protocols through hardware and um, then right through to um, economics and policy. One of the things that people have um, worried about um, off and on over many years is whether payment should be centralized or distributed. And one of the earliest means of payment, which I wrote about in my security engineering book, um, were the clay tablets that were used to record um, bags of wheat that you had left at the town storeroom. Um, the one on the left is from Iran about 4,000 years ago. Um, However, it's a little bit difficult to use these as artifacts of trade because the relationship is between you and the storehouse keeper. And so um, by 700 BC, people started using coins as tokens and the coin on the right is also from Iran about 400 BC. And note that we've moved from a centralized system to a distributed system, but the system isn't entirely distributed because there is of course the mint um, in which people trust. Now, the pendulum has swung back and forth um, over the centuries, but for most of my working life, we've been centralizing payments and putting them online. Uh, back in the 1980s, for example, I was working for various banks on ripping out systems and replacing them with newer systems, which were typically entirely centralized. So if ATMs couldn't work um, online, then they wouldn't work at all. Uh, uh, networks were just about good enough to do that by the early 1990s. And in Britain, the last offline ATMs moved online in 1993. Now, EMV, European MasterCard Visa, the chip and pin system that people from Europe carry in our pockets and is now being rolled out in America um, is also essentially centralized because there's a shared key crypto used between the card and the card issuing bank. Um, there are offline fallback modes of operation used for small payments, um, but if a merchant relies on these exclusively, then there are various card forgery attacks. But does this mean that online has won completely? No. Well, we're beginning to realize that there are some applications are going to remain um, stubbornly um, offline. And this raises some questions about, for example, Bitcoin. Um, we think of Bitcoin as a distributed system, but when you think about it, it's actually um, an entirely centralized system where there is one ledger, and that ledger has a very distributed implementation. But functionally, from the point of view of the payment system, it's as if you had an entirely trusted party running a big server somewhere in a vault in Switzerland to which everybody had to compete in order to, uh, had to connect um, in order to make uh, uh, transactions. And I will talk later about the nature of centralized versus distributed and how the centralized and distributed aspects can be different in surprising ways in different systems. Now, of all the things that I've done in my um, working life, the one that has had the most impact in the real world um, is almost certainly the STS specification, uh, which um, Johann Bezeidenhout, Don Taylor and I developed um, a bit over 20 years ago for prepayment electricity meters. The application that we had then was electrifying three million houses in South Africa um, after Nelson Mandela's uh, victory in the election there. And how do you electrify someone's house if they don't even have an address, let alone a credit rating? Uh, the answer is you use cryptography. Um, you use a 20-digit uh, number, which you basically buy from a cash machine or from a vending machine in a village store. 20 digits gives you 66 bits, so that's two bits of plain text and 64 bits of um, DES, nowadays triple DES ciphertext, and that contains commands to the meter such as dispense 20 kilowatt hours of electricity. That started off being a distributed system because the, the tokens were sold from machines in the villages, 
but following frauds and theft of machines that became centralized. And these systems now used in over 100 countries tend to use a server backend with hardware security modules where the magic numbers um, are generated and statistics of electricity purchasing and so on are, are collated. Now that taught us a number of things. One of them was that technology appropriately used can be a real boon in development. And another was the usability thing that even people who can't read and write can copy numbers, right? Because everybody can use a phone. And so there's no difficulty getting people to copy a 20 digit um, number from a ticket into a cash machine, into a, in, into a meter, provided you group it appropriately. For example, as three groups of four follow, followed by two groups of four. And to get that right, you've got to do some significant usability testing, which in fact we had a paper at Auckland 1995 des describing the design and all the testing that we did. So the application to which we're turning now is the mobile money revolution. Now, this is something that started off about 10 years ago. Um, one of my um, co-authors on the meter paper was involved in an early system in South Africa, but the software written by the supplier there was taken up by a firm in Kenya and um, suddenly took off like a bushfire. What they were trying to do in Kenya was to set up a microcredit system so that people could go and borrow 100 or 200 bucks to buy farm tools or whatever. But people found that it was much more useful to use this system to send money to each other. And the killer app was if some guy from a poor part of Western or Northern Kenya goes into Nairobi or Mombasa and gets a job and wants to send back $5 or $10 each week to his mum, then if you can send money by your mobile phone and pay only 3% in the process, then that certainly beats putting banknotes in the post and having them stolen half the time. So how mobile money works is that you send an encrypted SMS to a central server saying, uh, please pay Bob $4. And the central server debits your account by $4 and sends a, an encrypted SMS to Bob saying, you are now $4 richer. It really is that simple. And we see here um, the top left, that's Bcash in Bangladesh. And there at the bottom is Impeza, which is the, uh, the system that took off in Kenya and inspired many followers. There's about 200 of these systems worldwide, of which 20 have become real big time in the sense that they transmit a substantial proportion of the country's uh, GDP. In Kenya, it's about 12% of GDP goes over Impeza. And this has been really good uh, because Previously, the number of people who had bank accounts in um, less developed countries was only a few percent. It was the urban middle class. The poorer communities were miles away, uh, days, days walking from the nearest bank branch. And all of a sudden, because mobile phones um, got almost everywhere, uh, they brought banking services in their wake. And this meant that you could have direct payments and remittances. You could support um, things like microcredit. Um, you could store value, you could save up money. Um, a, a reason many people use Impeza in Nairobi is uh, for personal safety because there's a huge big slum, there's a lot of muggers about and you don't want to have hundreds of dollars in your pocket. But if a mugger takes your phone off you, you simply go to the nearest Impeza agent and you get it cancelled and um, your, your balance, if it hasn't been spent already, is still intact. Also, um, it helps development by providing a channel for providing government payments and services. Things like welfare payments, things like agricultural subsidies can be paid a lot more efficiently if you don't have to trust a chain of middlemen who may often um, steal the money or extort a percentage from the payees. And people are busy developing all sorts of apps which connect people to the online world. And uh, the interfaces they use are somewhat clunky, especially if you don't have a smartphone but it's getting there and it's making a big difference. Um, as for example, mobile phones have moved down the coast of India, um, economists have noticed that the price of fish in the various wholesale markets almost instantly leveled out uh, because people could trade, because fishermen could decide which harbor to land their catch at and so on. So you had huge welfare and efficiency gains. So what's left to do? Well, in um, Kenya, Roughly 20% of the population um, don't have access to mobile networks. Um, the mobile networks claim that they've got 92% of the country by economic value, by GDP. But of course, the areas that are left out tend to be the poor remote areas, places at the Ugandan border, 
um, you know, up in the north near Ethiopia and so on and so forth. Another problem is what happens when the network service is intermittent because of congestion or power cuts. It's a big deal in Nairobi, we found out, if network congestion is such that you try and pay somebody, you know, four dollars on your phone, you know, right, to buy a hamburger or whatever, and you, you stand there for 90 seconds waiting for the confirmation message to come through to the payee, you know, and you're standing there and he's standing there with the hamburger and there's five people standing in line behind you and you know, people are beginning to move about on their feet a bit. So that's an issue. Power cuts are an issue. Network um, downtime for maintenance or for political reasons is also an issue. In Uganda, for example, the last time they had a, an, an election, uh, the local network Airtel went down for six days and they said this was because of a network upgrade. Yeah, sure. Um, but after the election, when President Museveni had been elected for yet another term, the first thing that happened is that millions of people went to the mobile banking system and took their money out because they'd been without money for six days, uh, and, and that hurt. Another issue is network charges and transaction fees, uh, because if you're paying 3% and perhaps a minimum of 4 cents per SMS, then, you know, if you're on $2 a day, that actually matters. And finally, there's an issue of standards and interoperability for international remittances, because very, very large numbers of uh, people um, in less developed countries go and work across borders to send money home. Uh, my co-author in this, Khaled Bakr, is from Bahrain, and uh, in Bahrain there are, there are more foreign guest workers than there are locals, and so there's, there's a huge business in people sending money home. Could you possibly have some standard for doing this so that a Kenyan, for example, working in Bahrain could just load up on Peza in Bahrain and send it directly to his mum? This would be seriously useful. So this leads us to the project that we've been doing for the last year or so, the Digitali project as we call it. And this um, had its roots about 18 months ago in a call by the Gates Foundation for ideas to increase merchant use of mobile money. Now, Bill and Melinda Gates have um, funded dozens and dozens and dozens of mobile money schemes around the world uh, because of the evidence that this is a serious help to development. And so we went and talked to operators and users in a whole number of countries, and we found that the, the top issues uh, were network access, particularly for people in areas that, that weren't well served, or where the, the, the network was intermittent or um, at some distance from the village. And then the issue was cost. So this does vary between countries, because in some countries the phone company runs the payment service, and in other countries it doesn't. Uh, but um, network access is usually way up there. So here's the engineering problem. How do you send a payment between two phones when there's no GSM signal? Well, if you've got one of these modern smartphones that almost all of us carry around, um, then that's essentially trivial. There are lots and lots of ways of doing that, from NFC to Bluetooth to uh, local Wi-Fi and so on, and implementing that is just a matter of the engineering detail. But what about basic handsets? Right? The middle classes in Nairobi use smartphones just like us, but the poor people in the countryside um, are using simple feature phones that they buy for $8 or so, and they don't run apps, they are not programmable um, in any easy and obvious way. Well, so what we decided to do was to build a prototype per system to do research on offline mobile payments. And the basic idea is that we copy short authentication codes from one phone to another. So this worked with meters. Can we make it work with phones? Um, we know that you can authenticate stuff by copying numbers backwards and forwards. Uh, message authentication codes have been around since the 1970s. Um, but can we make it work in practice? Can you make it usable? Can you make it acceptable? Uh, because if you can do that, maybe there's a chance you can roll out something that's transformative. So the thing that facilitated the project was the invention of something called the overlay SIM. Now, the overlay SIM um, is basically a SIM card which has been um, slimmed down to 120 microns, and it's got contacts on the back as well as on the front. And you can think of this as Charlie, right? Um, Charlie is the person who does middle, middle person attacks in cryptography. 
Okay, so there are factories in China now turning out Charlie, very, very high quality Charlies in very, very large numbers. And so what you do is you take your overlay SIM and you stick it on the SIM card in your phone and, and the, um, the queen contacts, as they call it, uh, stick to the SIM card contacts and the king contacts then um, are, are what your mobile phone contacts. And this means that you can create an extra route of trust in the phone and you can write your apps in there and people can, by means of the SIM menu, pull up a menu with which they interact with your application. You can also do it as an overlay payment service in that if you've got an existing payment service, right, um, you can put an overlay purse application on top which talks to your existing payment service when that payment service is available, but when it's not available, allows you to interact in other ways. And, and finally, the advantage of doing this is that since you're not connecting anything to the mobile phone network, you don't have any regulatory issues. You don't have to worry about the phone company or the central bank or whatever sending around the police to um, arrest you. So this gives us the potential to do banking transactions in simple phones, in less developed country environments, and to compute authorization codes just like EMV. Okay, so there's the platform. And I stress that this is just an R&D platform. If you're deploying this at scale, then in a typical case, you would build this into your SIM toolkit. Uh, but of course, you know, that's the sort of thing that takes years to roll out uh, and involves regulatory stuff. And so for experimental purposes, the overlay SIM is great. So a background on short message authentication. This is something that I think um, researchers might do well to have a closer look at because there's a lot of it around and I don't know of any systematization of knowledge paper, for example, that describes how telex test keys, which were used for banking transactions before SWIFT, um, operate. Um, nuclear firing codes, thanks to Gus Simmons, there's a few papers on how that works, and um, I wrote up some of that in my book. Um, the CVV authentication codes that you have uh, on the signature strip of your uh, bank card and in the mag stripe and, in, and, and on the chip. Um, these are just examples of many, many um, applications that use short message authentication codes. And the goal is typically to operate in offline or constrained environments where you are using the human um, as part of the communications channel. And so you want only a, a small number of digits that people don't have to repeatedly go back and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and copy. So there are obvious trade-offs here between security and usability. And how we tackled this was uh, to say, let's do the usability first. Because if you have got a system that's enormously complicated and proven secure, but no one can use, that doesn't get you anywhere, except perhaps a chapter in your PhD. But if you want to change the world, you've got to have something that people can use. And so that's where you should start. So the starting point was to take the existing transaction flow in M-Pesa or Bcash and the other systems, most of which were founded on the same um, initial piece of software, um, and adapt that as little as we needed to in order to make things work. So background, an M-Pesa transaction. Alice wants to pay Bob 400 Kenyan shillings, which is about $4. So Bob gives her his phone number. If you go to a supermarket in Nairobi, you'll see that there are short codes up in posters on top of the checkouts. So Alice has got Bob's phone number. Alice enters the phone number, $4, and the phone says, put in your PIN. Um, and so an encrypted SMS um, is um, sent to the phone company. Um, the phone company checks the crypto, um, debits Alice's account, credits Bob's account, and um, Bob gets um, a confirmation SMS after some random delay, which is due to network congestion in town. So that's how it works. It's conceptually, it's really, really simple. So this is how our prototype works. So Alice wants to pay Bob four bucks for a taxi ride. So the first thing is that they um, give each other their phone numbers. And in, in, in the case of a taxi, the taxi driver will, of course, have his phone number prominently displayed on the, on, 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 on the back of his headrest. And um, Alice will also give Bob the taxi driver her phone number. And that's one of the extra things that you have to do in, uh, for, um, for reasons that will become clear now. Because what Bob then uh, does is selects Alice's name, that is Alice's phone number, and says that he wants $4 from her. 
and his phone then generates a random challenge, which is basically uh, an auth request, which is basically an AES Mac um, on um, her phone number, his phone number, the amount, and one or two other parameters. And he then shows um, or reads this to Alice. So she taps $4 and the random challenge on her phone. And if they agree, then both phones know that you have got the same um, pair, the same payee, and the same amount. So you're good to go. And so Alice's phone then proceeds to the payment stage. Alice enters her PIN, if that's required for the amount in question. Her phone displays $4 paid and an eight-digit authorization response, which she then reads or shows to Bob. He taps in the code, and if it's right, the phone displays $4 received. And there's a full log of the transaction. So this involves the copying of an eight-digit number backwards and forwards, plus the setup phase, which you do in any case with M-Pesa transactions. So what does it look like under the hood? Well, those of you who've worked a little bit with crypto protocols will um, recognize how this sort of thing goes. Um, so Alice agrees to pay Bob X, and each of them enters this amount and the other party's phone number, that is their name, into their phones. Bob chooses a three-digit nonce NB and forms a three-digit Mac C um, using the shared secret key K of B and X and tells Alice the values NB and C, where C is the Mac. Alice verifies the Mac and authorizes the transaction using her PIN to create a nonce and the, challenge, and the response to the challenge NA and R, where R is just a Mac of everything that she's seen up till now, mod 10 to the 4. Um, Bob enters this uh, nonce and R into his purse, that's where the, the code comes from, and um, verifies that it's incremented by X. Now, this verifies in a perfectly straightforward way using um, Martin's logic, the Burroughs of Badi Needham logic. And so we presented this at our security group one Friday, and then Marcus Kuhn puts his hand up and says, Oi, there's an attack on that. Anyone see the attack? Um, well, this again is normal. It's hard to see attacks in protocols. But the attack is that the, uh, the challenge C is only three digits. So you can do a, a birthday attack on it. So Bob chooses a higher price X dashed, and Bob generates new nonces to find a collision. And um, once he's found a collision, such that the higher amount gives the same challenge C with the new nonce as the uh, original transaction, he aborts all the other transactions and then gives N, B, and C to Alice, but on his SIM uses N, B dashed and X dashed. And that means that Alice pays X, but Bob gets X dashed, which is greater than X. And this means that you have created money and bankers don't like systems where you can create money. So that's a no-no. The fix, as it turns out, is, as usual, completely easy once you've seen the attack. Um, you simply compute the response on the actual amount rather than using the truncated value C. There are one or two other things you have to worry about. You have to worry about the possibility that Bob could try to add money to his SIM card by faking transactions with fake customers and just guessing the response. And so we had a long discussion about whether you need to have a six-digit um, authorization code or seven or eight. And in fact, when we did our usability studies, um, uh, three of the experimental subjects said it would be convenient if you had to use a little bit less than eight digits so that you could memorize the whole um, response. Uh, but that's the sort of design point that this thing is, uh, is, is, is working at. What you can also do if you're Bob is you can try and fake transactions with real customers by keeping a record of um, uh, their Mac replies. Um, and again, you use birthday techniques to try and find um, some fake transaction. And the issue here is that most formal methods tools don't track ent entropy. Um, there are one or two that are starting to do that. And we discussed this in a paper at the Protocols Workshop at Brno in uh, March, I think it was. But if you're working with short message authentication codes, where you're trying to design down to the wire for usability reasons, then the amount of entropy is something that you have to keep careful track of. So this is another um, potential 
area of research. Can we come up with better formal methods tools that enable us to track entropy, um, but in um, a nice, efficient way uh, without creating a whole, whole lot of clutter and making a tool that's difficult to use? Another thing that I'll just mention in passing is that for the purpose of our trials, we've been assuming that all the payments are small. Now, given the state of hardware tamper resistance and the way banks work, banks are generally happy um, to allow transactions to be authenticated using a universal shared master secret that's protected by the hardware tamper resistance of modern smart cards, uh, but only up to a certain amount of perhaps £20 or $30 or something like that, and only provided there are reasonable back-end intrusion detection controls um, implemented. But if you've got a successful system, you then start to worry about whether you can use it for bigger payments, right? Because if one of the killer applications is going to be people sending money home to mum from Nairobi, right, then a guy may start off working as a builder's laborer and is sending home only 20 pounds a month, but maybe he becomes the foreman and he now wants to send home 50 pounds every month or 100. Can we build a system that will handle bigger payments? And so the the thing that you can do here is that you can turn the bug in the Needham-Schroeder protocol into a feature. Because you see, when you have done an offline payment, it then gets automatically uploaded by Alice and by Bob, whichever of them comes into network first, so you can update your back-end shadow accounts. And once both of them have called home, then of course you can reconcile the transaction and kick in your intrusion detection stuff. But what you can also do is you can see to it that whenever Alice talks to Bob for the first time, Sam wakes up and says, aha, I'd better generate a KAB for the two of those guys in case they want to share larger amounts of money. And so there's a whole bunch of stuff you can do about seeing to it that although you start small um, with, say, transactions up to 2,000 Kenyan shillings, um, once both Alice and, and Bob have talked to Sam, um, they can do unlimited transactions. And if people are doing repeated transactions, you can use shorter codes. So there's a number of design options there for later rollout time. And there are some questions. Suppose, for example, um, your mum out in Busia never goes into network because the network there is just so lousy and she's housebound. Uh, do you have a mechanism for getting the, the encrypted KAB packet um, uh, from um, Sam via Alice or via some other channel to Bob? Um, how many digits is it reasonable for somebody to type into their phone? And again, this is stuff that we, ex that we explore in the, in the technical paper on this. Now, crypto design is all very well, um, but the, the real thing for something like this is usability. So of course we do pilot stuff in the uh, lab and we get students to play with it and we get comments from them. But the real acid test is a couple of field trials and we did the first one at the beginning of September uh, with um, Joe Sevilla, who runs the information security um, group at Strathmore University in Nairobi, and his colleague, uh, Lorna Mutegi. So what we did was we tried the payment system out in three outlets. One of them was the um, campus bookshop, where there's a, a single till, and it's, it's kind of quiet. People will come in every five minutes or so and buy a book. And so there's lots of time for people to fiddle around with an unfamiliar payment protocol. And then there's the coffee shop where there's two tills and there's bursty traffic. And each of these tills is a person both making coffee and uh, taking money, unlike at Starbucks, for example, where these functions are separated. And then the thing that we thought would be the biggest problem of all, the cafeteria. And um, there you suddenly have hundreds and hundreds of students descend on the cafeteria at 12 o'clock. Uh, and they, they grab their plates of rice and stew or whatever, and they head towards the checkout. There's five checkout lanes um, and um, great big long queues of people waiting to pay and eat. And that's where we anticipated that there would be problems. We got a dozen students that we equipped with phones with Digitali um, SIMs, and we saw that there was a split male, female, art, science, and urban rural. And there's the students with um, uh, Khaled, um, on the roof of the um, IT building in Strathmore. So there's the bookshop. As you can see, it's um, a pretty typical campus bookshop. We've got our sign digitally accepted here. Um, and there's the process of doing a payment transaction as people copy uh, numbers backwards and forwards between the two phones. 
There's the coffee shop, um, which gets big bursts of traffic um, between lectures and also just after lunch, but otherwise it's a bit sleepy. And again, we get our signage up, and there people do the transaction with two phones just over the till, uh, just over the counter. And there's the cafeteria, and as you can see, they've already got their sign up for uh, M-Pesa agent number. Uh, so um, you've got all the information that you need uh, in order to make a payment to M-Pesa, and they've even got a list of all the uh, transactions, uh, transaction fees, the uh, roughly 3% or so that, you, that it costs you to take money out of the system. And so we got our signage up there too. And in the case of the cafeteria checkouts, um, there's a perspex divider between the cashier and the students, and so the students and the cashiers take turns to basically uh, put their phone against the perspex and show the other party what the number is so it can be copied down. And so what we found was that things worked fine in the bookshop as we expected. People have plenty of time to play around with it. The coffee shop staff didn't like it because they were busy making coffee and also taking money. And the fact that they had to go backwards and forwards, they found, got in the way of their workflow. Um, also, they're usually being paid cash. And they were a little bit worried about whether, when their back was turned, somebody might steal the phone off the counter. So it was just the bother of having to you know, handle a small phone that was you know, a potentially stealable object. So that wasn't too surprising. But the, the really pleasant surprise is that the cafeteria staff strongly preferred Digitale to Impesa. And I thought, well, hey, this is um, a really um, great and interesting result. Why is it? Uh, well, it's simply because they're fed up having to wait for about a minute for the confirmation message um, from Mpesa to come through Nairobi's cloud, uh, cr uh, crowded GSM networks. And so as far as they were concerned, OK, you have to copy eight digits this way and eight digits that way, but it's a deterministic process, which takes between 30 and 40 seconds. And once the customer has done her thing and you've done your thing, um, bang, there's the payment, move on, next customer, please. And it's great. People love that. So there's a full usability study paper in preparation where we're looking at error rates and timings and all the rest of it. And um, I don't know where we'll send that, um, maybe soups or somewhere like that, but we're doing that in collaboration with our colleagues in Nairobi. The final thing um, for this phase of the project is pre-market research. So um, thanks to our colleagues in Strathmore who kind of know everybody in town, uh, we talked to Safaricom, the incumbent phone company which runs Impesa, the other phone company, Airtel, um, the president's office, um, because you have to speak to the regulators, and um, one bank, Equity Bank, that's been trying to establish its own mobile money system. And the interesting thing is that they've been using overlay SIMs uh, because that's the way that they can get their products out there um, in a world that all of a sudden is dominated by the... Um, uh, by M-Pesa. And for the banks, M-Pesa has been a real shock because they used to rule supreme in the world of payments in Kenya. And all of a sudden, along comes one of the phone companies and basically steals their lunch. And Safaricom's uh, market cap is now eight times Equity Bank's market cap. And so the bankers are real sore about this and want to do something about it. And so having talked to uh, these guys, we also did market research in one of the richest towns um, in uh, Kenya. Tika is where the father of the nation, Jomo Kenyatta, lived as a young man. And it's just an hour north of Nairobi. They've got everything, schools, hospitals, tarred roads. Um, you know, it's, it's definitely pretty prosperous. And one of the poorest, which is Busia, um, which is in the west of the country on the shores of Lake Victoria. So that's Busia. And the people there live by fishing. Um, basically, that's where tilapia comes from, and that's what people eat. Um, it's at the crossroads of Africa. You've got Uganda here. You've got Rwanda there. There's been a lot of conflict. There's a very, very high level of HIV AIDS. Um, about half the people don't have shoes. A lot of the kids don't even have pants. Um, you know, there's tangible, visible poverty. And, um, and, and there isn't very good networking services either. Uh, because the, f the Kenyan phone companies and the Ugandan phone companies haven't been able to agree um, on uh, frequency allocations. And so near the border zone, they, in the they interfere with each other's networks. 
So there's the uh, Busia County office. There's Khaled with Lorna Mutegi, um, one of our collaborators. And in the county office, um, a couple of dozen people got together to have explained to them what the system could do, to play with it, to figure out how they could use it um, in terms of providing local government services to um, um, their um, citizens and customers. Um, our, our colleagues at um, Strathmore um, have got some IT systems which they run and maintain for Busia, and that gave us the necessary entrance. So what we found from this pre-market research was that the rich county thought that this is, hey, this is a really interesting technology. Um, you know, everybody there had smartphones, everybody there understood uh, technology, programming, you know, they had sophisticated systems for collecting taxes and paying pensions and so on. But they thought that the, the, the most useful thing that a new payment system could do would be help them to control money better. Um, and they were more interested in back ends uh, for existing Impeza systems uh, than in something that would deal with um, people who could not get connectivity. But the poor county in Busia, on the other hand, thought that this was truly awesome and could transform everybody's lives. Because in much of Busia, you just don't get GSM signal. And although it might be possible from some village to, for example, walk half a mile and stand on top of an anthill in order to get one bar, you can't do business that way. And so they're really, really keen um, to get some means of doing business offline. The downer for now is that the incumbent phone company, Safaricom, although they say that this is a nice technology and it could be useful, they don't have the space in their SIM card to put anything much new, and they're focused on maximizing the profits that they can get from their SIM space. So the sort of stuff that they're rolling out at the moment are things like gambling apps, uh, which are there to take money off um, you know, lower middle class people in Nairobi rather than help the really, the really poor people in the, in, the, in, in the rural areas who don't have payments at the moment. And the economic arguments that they put forward seem on the face of it to be compelling. And um, this is one of those are areas where you can have a good technology, um, but it may require a little bit of regulatory push or perhaps a bit of pull from charities to get it going right there. So. Um, basically, that's the story of phase one of this project. Um, the Gates Foundation paid us to develop a technology to extend mobile payments offline, and we've done that. It works both technologically and in the field. Um, Kenya's probably, at least in uh, the payment side, not going to be the first adopter. So we've talked to phone companies and payment companies in other countries, and the Gates Foundation may be one deployment channel um, because they um, support mobile, fa mo mobile phone uh, payment systems in about 20, uh, 20 countries. We've also talked to the UN's World Food Program, and we're also looking at the possibility of deploying this in other applications. For example, um, the guy who set up Mpeza um, retired from the company and did a startup called Mcopa, uh, which now enables you to um, buy solar on a pay-as-you-go basis. Right, because one of the, the big industries in Africa is getting uh, solar panels, which people can put on their houses in rural areas, and they get lighting, which is the main thing, so that kids can do homework without having to uh, do it by the far side and uh, suffer illnesses from smoke inhalation. But also people who get solar panels um, on their dwellings can then sell mobile phone charging services to their neighbors. So this is taking off um, real big time, but solar panels cost 200 bucks, and many people don't have 200 bucks in ready cash. So Mcopa allows people to um, basically get a solar panel and then pay for it, um, you know, a dollar a week through mobile phone uh, payments. So there's potential for the deployment of um, technologies like this with pay-as-you-go applications of various kinds. And again, we've been talking to various people, and um, there are one or two have um, rigged together ways of offline operating that um, kind of work for now but could perhaps be improved and standardized. So this isn't finished research, but if you like, the first phase of a startup where the um, second phase may go in a slightly different direction. Um, one of the reasons that stuff like this matters is because of delay tolerant networks. There's 
going to be a change in technology as we get online services to the last one or two billion human beings. There's a colleague of mine, for example, at the lab who's been doing some work with a village in Brazil where they don't have GSM service. They're about an hour and a half on the speedboat from Manaus. And so if the young people there want to check their Facebook status, there's two things they can do. They can ride the speedboat into Manaus for 10 bucks, spend all day, and get network service and get all the updates on their phone. Or they can give their phone to the speedboat driver for 50 cents, and he'll take it into town and bring it back in the evening. This is delay-tolerant network, right? And we've heard of this even being used in Sweden, of all places, in the Finnmark, uh, where people in remote Lappish villages will give their mobile phones to the helicopter driver for the same reasons. Now, can we do better than these ad hoc mechanisms? Can we start to provide bits of infrastructure that work for places where delay tolerant networking is going to have to take place? Well, we think that tools like Digitally uh, can be part of that research program. Um, lightweight shared key crypto also matters because we're moving into a world in which there will be more and more hardware tamper resistant devices. Um, in your phone, for example, uh, you've got your SIM card, you've got your NFC chip, um, you may have a TPM, um, you have got um, enclaves, right, in ARM Trust Zone, you may have enclaves in future Intel processors and various other things that people are working on. There are going to be all sorts of real and virtual hardware security modules um, in all sorts of devices. And where you can use lightweight shared key crypto, there's lots and lots of stuff that you can use it for. Ron Rivest once famously um, likened cryptography to duct tape, and this is um, becoming more and more clear uh, that you can do all sorts of stuff on a lightweight basis. One of the things we did, for example, the, um, you know, was, uh, um, was a protocol where you set up keys optimistically um, and opportunistically and grow a network that way without the, the need for any centralized certification. Uh, 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 and, um, and, and that's been deployed in one or two places. So bootstrapping, rate control, denial of service prevention. So what sort of lessons did we learn from um, an exercise like this? Well, build it and try it out, if at all possible. Uh, get your research students to actually build something and get it in the field. Uh, my thesis advisor, the late Roger Needham, used to say good research comes from real problems. Um, and I've always followed that advice and it's been really good to me. The next thing is start with the people, not with the technology. There are lots and lots of people who start off with an existing pile of technology and try and invent a new widget, an existing um, software uh, library and they add a new function. Um, or an existing pile of theorems and they try and add another theorem. Um, there are so many people doing that and there are so few people who start off with people's actual needs um, that that's potentially a place where you can get much higher return on investment. So when you do that, you have to look at needs and design for usability. Another point is that when we think about security protocols, we tend to think about Alice and Bob in an abstract way with um, bits of cryptography going backwards and forwards. Uh, but protocols with human participants are, I think, worth systematic study. There have been one or two papers on this. The word ceremonies was coined 15 years ago by Carl Ellison. And Matt Blaze wrote a nice, nice paper on how protocols such as how a wine waiter operates are actually security protocols if you analyze them correctly. But I think there's an awful lot more still to do in this particular area. A surprisingly common example of ceremonies um, are short message authentication protocols. And there you have to ask, can I do more with less? And of course, this gets you to interesting technical problems as we saw earlier on. Uh, another of uh, Roger Needham's sayings was that optimization is the process of taking something that works and replacing it with something that almost works but is cheaper. And that, of course, leads to um, all sorts of problems and gotchas. And so when, it's you, when you try to optimize the technology so that you can do a payment in eight, eight digits copied, seven, six digits, can you do it in five? What sort of things come up and bite you when you try and design it closer and closer to the wire? Deeper lessons learned. One of the things that we've been doing is the economics of security 
uh, because we know that many things fail when the incentives are wrong. But economic incentives are also critical to deployability. And we have one or two papers in the security economics literature, but not anything like enough, on why it is that some um, security products and protocols succeed in the marketplace and others don't. Why is it that SSH took, up, took off, for example, when SET didn't? Answer, SSH gave you accession teleportation, which was really useful, and it gave you cryptography as well for free. So incentives matter. Pushing this a little bit further from security economics to security politics, um, the more I see of such things, the more I realize that institutions matter and regulation because we've seen an awful lot written and spoken about disruptive technology um, over the past few years. And when you think about what firms like Uber and Airbnb are doing, they're actually defeating regulation so as to replace tired institutions. Okay, so there's a monopoly on taxis in a given city. Well, that on the face of it is useful because it stops you being ripped off at the airport by a complete cowboy, but it becomes uh, fat and complacent after a while and um, you know prices go up and service goes down. Can you bring in competition with technology? Given smartphones, sure. Can you deal with the quality problem? Sure, you can have a recommender system. Uh, is there going to be political turmoil? Hey, sure. Um, black cab drivers uh, demonstrating in London. This is about politics as well as about technology. So to get back to my initial theme, if you're going to ask yourself is a, is a payment system centralized or decentralized? One of the things you have to ask is, what's the source of market power? How is it that M-Pesa is the dominant payment system in Kenya? Well, they've got the governments on their side now. To start off with, like an IT business, they, they ran basically on network effects. Um, the difficulty of challenging them now is not just that they have got network effects, but that there's a short resource. And the short resource that stops you fielding your own payment system, except in a very constrained environments such as a refugee camp, is the ability to turn cash into electrons. What makes M-Pesa difficult to challenge now in Kenya is the fact that they've got over 40,000 agents, people in kiosks, who will take your Kenya shilling notes and who will do a magic thing on their phones which causes money to appear in your accounts. And these agents will then get their 2% or their 3% or whatever. And setting up that infrastructure is hard. Now, um, if you are going to have a completely decentralized payment system, uh, then issues like that have to be um, thought through. Now, interestingly enough, the incumbent, M-Pesa, saw off a Bitcoin challenger, BitPesa. Uh, people thought, well, we've got M-Pesa, why can't we have a Bitcoin equivalent? Uh, Bitcoin um, was threatening to M-Pesa. M-Pesa, having been the insurgent 10 years ago, is now the incumbent. They've got the government to invest their pension fund money in the company. So they were able to persuade the government that um, regulation should be used to crack down on the BitPesa challenger. And finally, I think you have to think through the ethics. Uh, M-Pesa started off uh, as a service for the poor, um, whereas their then incumbent Airtel network um, uh, was basically serving the rich middle classes in Nairobi. Safaricom, having built a huge following from the poor, then moved smartly up market so that it could monetize uh, its network power uh, by you know, selling things like gambling apps, leaving the poor stranded. Um, there are ethical issues there, and one can't, of course, expect a company with shareholders to tackle them on its own. There is a role for regulation, and in countries where regulation is weak, um, there are further issues, and there are other institutions, of course, such as the Gates Foundation that can push in the other direction. So, more, we've got a, uh, a project web page on Digitali, and there's the stuff on bank fraud, and, um, and finally, of course, if you want to see the, the stuff that we did on um, Metos all those years ago, and which provided the foundation for that, uh, there's a chapter on that in my book. Thanks. We've got time for a few questions. Well, let me start. 
So, Ross, there are, there are a number of uh, dimensions to the work that you're doing. It's uh, very amazing, brilliant work, I think. And um, so I'm wondering how much time you spend among technology, government, business, uh, user studies, these, these sorts of uh, areas. Cause they... Well, in this particular project, um, Khaled um, has ended up doing um, um, almost all of the technical work, and I've ended up putting much of my efforts into what are basically sales tasks, you know, calling people up, arranging meetings, um, uh, you know, working my contacts, um, getting in to see phone companies and banks and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, that's how things tend to go in a project like this, that, you know, um, half of the effort goes into the marketing and half of the effort goes into the engineering. Hi, uh, Kevin Butler, University of Florida. We've actually been doing some work in the security of a digital finance space, so this is a very interesting talk. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask about um, your uh, experience with uh, SIM overlay cards in particular. Those, uh, mm -hmm. uh, our discussions with the GSMA uh, have, uh, they have a very, uh, they're not particularly impressed by overlays of both because of their uh, potential to be man in the middle between the main SIM and their just inherent fragility when they're being deployed on actual phones. Uh, what has your experience been with both elements of that? We haven't had problems with fragility. An equity bank has deployed about 50,000 um, um, overlay SIMs to real customers. Um, Safaricom has deployed about 5,000 because they've got an app for the Nairobi police that uses them. Um, one thing I should have perhaps said as, uh, you know, among the lessons learned and opportunities for future research, but you know, there's only so much time, is this. Um, overlay SIMs are absolutely great for doing security research in any object that involves smart cards, right? Because if you want to know what's going on between, for example, smart cards and a hardware security module, um, you know, there, there is your tool of choice. It's that simple. Um, there's a downside as well. Uh, some people here may know of our no-pin attack, which we had at Auckland, what, five years ago? Basically, um, we'd found that people had been able to construct middle-person devices um, such that they could use a stolen chip and pin card without knowing the pin by persuading the smart card that it was doing a chip and signature transaction and persuading the uh, pin entry device that it had actually accepted the pin. And these were seen in, in, in Europe about five years ago. We now have some evidence through you know, the, the work that we do collecting data on cybercrime and payment fraud and so on, uh, that these overlay SIMs are now being used in China to do no pin attacks. And in particular, we've got one case where a UK resident went to South China and um, had his card stolen. And it, it appears to have been a no pin attack that was used to loot it. So yeah, um, overlay SIMs are dangerous kit, and there was um, something from the GSMA in about 2014 that you can probably find online, um, warning um, of uh, the hazards of the thing as a, 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 as a fraud vector. So, so yeah, I mean, it's dual use technology. Thanks. Okay, we got one. Uh, thank you, Russ. Go ahead, go ahead, Peter. Sorry, I didn't see. Okay. Um, so it seems to me that uh, you're using uh, regular cell phones, dumb phones. Yep. Uh, and that's a bottleneck on the security and the usability. Uh, yep. It would be easier and uh, more uh, fun to use uh, sm uh, smartphones. So my question is, uh, there are so many smartphones that people throw away in the developing world. Um, and also, I guess, uh, things will get uh, cheaper over time. So wh what is the, uh, are we going to see I mean, five years from now uh, solutions that could use uh, smartphones in these uh, developing countries? Well, there's no reason why not. We reckon that the window of opportunity for something like Digitali, you know, for the application that we've designed it for is perhaps 10 years. Um, Sure, lots of smartphones are thrown away or traded in in the West, and there are agents who buy these in by the container load and take them to countries like Kenya and sell them. 
Uh, similarly, uh, most of the cars on sale in Africa are second-hand cars that people buy up in markets in Britain or Austria or whatever, depending on what side of the road people are driving on, and ship out to Africa. So uh, there's, there's an awful lot of technology re reuse down there. Okay. Thanks, Ross. Thanks.